maybe scenes of scenes of uh, marital unfaithfulness on the television, sounds of taking the Lord's name in vain, maybe just listening to talk radio or to uh, news radio, all of the politics, all of the discussions, all of the arguments about sports or about who said what or about you know who did what and it's just all there just kind of swirling around inside of our lives it's just there and we live in a society not as beautiful as this one every day and not as maybe uh just disjointed as calhoun walled city but it seems like our lives are just there's so many opportunities so many different ways you could go and our lives sometimes could become like that, where we are here a little, there a little, not in God's word, but just with this and with that and with the other thing. Joseph lived in a society that was a godless society. He lived in the midst of a society that enticed people with sinful lusts and selfish gratification. But how did he rise to the second most powerful man in the most powerful nation in the whole world in spite of the society that he lived in. I would like to know how, wouldn't you? I would like to thrive in this spiritual Egypt that we live in today, wouldn't you? Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 41. Maybe we can figure out how to take our lives from being all disjointed to going in one direction as individuals and as a people. I'd like to share today with you three principles that I find in, in this story about Joseph and about his uh, practice of life, his mindset, Gen Genesis chapter 41. And we can start just in, uh, excuse me, 39. Let's start and we're going to back up here because we're going to see that Joseph knew what his immediate goal was, even though he didn't know what the end goal was. He knew what his immediate goal was. Genesis chapter 39, Genesis 39. And we're going to go to verses 3 and 4. Genesis 39, 3 and 4. This is before he was... This is before he was the second most powerful, obviously. Verses 3 and 4, we read this. When, Jesus, when, uh, when Joseph came to Egypt, this is what we read in verse 3, his master, speaking of Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him. Who was with Joseph? The Lord. the Lord was with Joseph, and that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hands. Who made it prosper? The Lord. The Lord. Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. What did Joseph do? He served him in the place where he was, and he made him... Potiphar made Joseph overseer over of his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. Joseph took where he was, and he did his best in that situation. Some people say it like this, bloom where you're planted. You ever heard that before? Bloom where you're planted. Where he was, he did his best. He wasn't at home anymore, was he? He wasn't with mom and dad anymore, was he? He wasn't with his brothers anymore, was he? He wasn't tending sheep anymore. He was a slave in Egypt. He was away from his home, a country that wasn't his own, a language that wasn't his own, with gods that weren't his own. But the Lord was with him, and he served his master right where he was. And if you know the story of Joseph, that even Mrs. Potiphar came up and tried to seduce him and solicitate uh, an extramarital affair with him and say, come lie with me. But he said, no. He knew why he was there. Well, he at least knew why he wasn't there. He knew he wasn't there to disobey the Lord, to dishonor the Lord. How about our day and age? How about your life today? Do you have a purpose for your life right now? Do you know what your purpose is? Do you know what your calling is at this moment? Joseph didn't know that he was going to be second most powerful man in the world. But he knew what he was doing that day. He knew what he was doing in that place. What are you doing where you are? Do you know what it is? 
Look to verse, uh, verses 21 and 22. Joseph says no to Mrs. Potiphar. He gets thrown into prison. And we read this in verses 21 and 22 of chapter 39 as well. Genesis 39, 21 and 22. After he gets put in prison, we read this in 21. The Lord was with Joseph. There it is again. And showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners that were in the prison. Whatsoever they did, he was the doer of it. Here he is again. What's he doing? He's doing the same thing, isn't he? He's not at home anymore. He's not in Potiphar's house anymore. Now he's in prison. But the Lord is with him. And what's he doing? He's doing his best where he is. So much so that the keeper of the prison saw that God was with him. The keeper of the prison saw that God was blessing him. And he was able to ascend, if you will, to the second most powerful man in the prison, even as a prisoner. He did what was right. He knew what he was doing, where he was. So it should be no surprise that by the time Pharaoh calls upon him, that he does the same thing. Genesis chapter 41, 38 through 43, 38 through 43. Verse 48 it says, And he gathered up all the food, we read. Excuse me, I say 38. I'm on the wrong one here. 38, back up here. Okay, 38. Pharaoh said unto his servants, after Joseph answered him about the dream, Pharaoh uh, said to his servants, Can we find such a one of, uh, as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Even Pharaoh didn't he. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none to dis, uh, so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. Verse 42 Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck and he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had and they cried before him, bow the knee! And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. How did he become ruler over all the land of Egypt? He was faithful, he was when he was there. When he was in Potiphar's house as a slave, he was there doing what he knew to, he, he should do. When he was in prison, he was there doing the best of what he knew he should do. When he was, came before, Potiphar, before Pharaoh, Pharaoh saw in him something special. Maybe Potiphar was there talking with Pharaoh saying, you know, this guy is actually really good. I know he's been a, a prisoner, but he's a very faithful man. Maybe the Keeper of the prison was there speaking to Pharaoh. I don't know. You know, this guy might be a prisoner, but he's an excellent spirit. And Pharaoh saw that and set him up in his place. If you want to do something great, do something small. Jesus said it this way, he who is faithful in little is faithful in much. So that's the first thing we see. Do you know what your goal is, what your purpose is today in your life right now? You're not just waiting, sitting back, doing nothing, waiting for that great expectation of something else, are you? You're not just waiting for that great opportunity ahead, are you? Let's right now do what is, we know to do best this time of our life. Great times ahead start with small works. Number two, not only did Joseph do what was right in every place that he was at that time, he remembered how God led him in the past. Let's go back even a little bit further in Joseph's life to chapter 37. We'll go to Genesis 37, verse 5. Genesis 37, verse 5. And then we'll read 9 through 11. Verse 5, we read this. Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him, hated him 
yet the more. So Joseph had a dream, didn't he? Remember this dream? All of his brother's sheaves bowed down to his sheave. They didn't like that at all. But that was a dream from the Lord. Now look at verses 30, or 9 and 11. Excuse me, verses 9 and 11. We see again something God gave him. 37 verses 9 and 11. He dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars. How many stars? 11, 11 stars, specifically thinking about his family, made, obedi- uh, made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? Somebody answer that question. Yes. Yes. And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Reminds me about... uh, Remember when Mary heard these things about Jesus and that he was, she was going to have this child, that she carried these things in her heart. <laughs> Can you imagine uh, uh, Joseph's father doing the same thing, just observing these things, just holding on to them, paying attention? This doesn't, seem like, this doesn't seem like something Joseph should be spouting out to the rest of the family, but if it's from the Lord, it's from the Lord. So here's Joseph. He comes into Potiphar's house, a slave, in a new country, new language, new gods, but he has something to hold on to, doesn't he? Can you imagine him at certain times in, in anguish, in, in despair maybe, just feeling like, Lord, I, I don't know why I'm here, but I remember how you led me in the past. Can you imagine that? Have you ever been in a situation like that before? Maybe you're in one right now. Maybe you're saying to yourself, Lord, what is my calling? What is, what is my place in life? What is my great adventure someday? But I know you have me where I am right now. You've led me in the past. You've done things in my life that brought me to this place. And friends, I will tell you the truth, and you know it when you read the scriptures here, that God was leading Joseph into Egypt. We know that at the very end, when he said to his brothers, don't be angry at yourselves for this thing. You meant it evil, but God meant it for good. He meant it to save life. Joseph saw that. At least then he saw it. Did he see it all before? I don't know. Did he hold on to that dream that God, had, those dreams that God had given him? I believe so. When he was in prison, same thing. He could say to himself, Lord, you gave me dreams, and you brought me to Potiphar's house. You blessed me there, and now I'm here. What do you have for me now at this time? When you're in Christ and you're being led by Christ, even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you shall fear no evil. Do those who are led by Christ have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death at times? Yes. Do we have to walk through dark places sometimes? Do we have to walk through places where we don't know where we're going or what two steps ahead is? God sometimes only gives us one step at a time. Sometimes we don't even know what our next step is. There's a good place to go. You don't know where to go with your feet. You go to your knees. Say, Lord, what's my next step? I'm going to plant myself here until you lead me forward. And then, of course, while you're walking step by step, do it in prayer as well. Joseph did this. Finally, he gets up to where Pharaoh is, and he was presented to Pharaoh. Joseph was able to see, I believe he was able to see at that moment, God was leading him to the next chapter in his life. Lord, you gave me dreams when I was a child. You led me to Potiphar's house and blessed me there. You led me to prison for some reason. You blessed me there. And now it's a new chapter in my life. Do you think Joseph could have confidence in that moment? I mean, he was in the court of the king. From prison to the palace. Do you think he could have confidence? Not because of his position. He was a slave. Not because of who he was in his title, because he was a prisoner but because of where God was leading him. How about you? Do you know what your place is, what your calling is right now, what your position is? Fortunately, none of you here are in prison today. Maybe there's a prison of sin that is choking you, though. Maybe right now you feel to yourself, I feel like I'm a prisoner. I feel like I can't break out of whatever that sin that might be holding you is. 
I'm not saying it's God's plan that we're in sin. Never, never, never. That God has a plan out of sin, amen? amen? He wants to deliver us from sin. So number one, Joseph bloomed where he planted, if you want to say it that way. He did what he knew where he was. Secondly, he remembered how God led in the past. Friends, how has God led you in the past? Just take a moment and think about it. How has he led you? Why are you here now? Why are you in the position you're in? Maybe the job you're in or the school you're in. What, how, maybe a ministry position that you're in. The family that you're in. How did you get there? Did God lead you there? God's got a plan for you. What is it? And thirdly, we can see that through Joseph's life, he remained stead, steadfastly faithful to God. Not only did he do what he knew to do in the place where he was, but who was with him? God was with him. In Potiphar's house, God was with him. In the prison, God was with him. When he went to Pharaoh's court, even Pharaoh could see that he had the Spirit of God with him. He was, and not only that, how do we have that? How do we have that, that abiding presence with God? Well, James tells us, you can hold your finger there if you want to, and go to the book of James. James chapter 4, verse 8. James 4, 8 tells us how to have God close to us. James 4, 8. There's other instruction here too, but we'll just look at this one verse and we'll couple it with a few other verses in Scripture. James 4, 8. How do we have God close to us? How do we have God near to us? How do we have God abiding with us as with Joseph? Here's what James 4, 8 says. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Think of it this way. Jesus says this, Seek and you shall find. Jeremiah says, You shall search for me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You want Jesus in your life? You want God in your life? Look for him. You will find him. Seek him and you will find him. Draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. And how do we do that? We do that through his word. We do that through prayer. And we do that with walking with him in Christian service. It's simple. He's given us that pattern in the sanctuary. He's shown it through, to us throughout scriptures. Prayer, Bible study, and Christian service. Couple that idea together, drawing near to God with what we read in John 6.44. John 6.44, a principle found there in John 6.44. John 6.44. Jesus speaking, helping us out a little bit with this. We draw near to God, he'll draw near to us. Here's what Jesus says about drawing near to God. Are you ready? Jesus says, no man can come to me. In other words, be drawn to him, be, come close to him. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last days. So how do we come to Jesus? Who draws us? Who takes the initiative? Who takes the first step? Friends, if you find yourself thinking to yourself, boy, I think I should pray right now. I feel convicted I need to spend time in the Word of God right now. I believe I need to help this person out. You know who really, whose thought that is? It's God's thought. And when you submit yourself, therefore, unto God, when you draw near to God in what He says, when He's calling you to do something and you do it, He draws near to you. And James tells us there, we submit ourselves therefore under God, we resist the devil, and he flees from us. Let's, let's put that together with one more thought of taking the initiative, Revelation chapter 3, Church of Laodicea, Jesus speaking to the Church of Laodicea, I hope that you're familiar with this verse, it's a wonderful promise, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, a wonderful promise that Jesus gives us, an explanation of how our relationship with him can grow. He says this, Revelation 3.20. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. This is what Joseph must have done. This is the principle, the principle, uh, the, the scripture principle of Christ being close to us and us being in Christ and being steadfast in him. He must have sought the Lord. He must have uh, allowed Christ into his life, let the, the pre-incarnate Christ, God, into his life. 
to be steadfast and walk with him day by day. Especially in a, in a uh, Egyptian society, of a heathen society that was calling and enticing him in every sense. You think about Daniel when he went to Babylon. Similar situation. There he was with all the dainties at the king's table and he said, no. There he was with a decree against him later on saying you can't pray to anybody except to, uh, to the king. And he said, no, I must stick with God. I must stay with God. I must stand with him. And even at the sake of his life, he did it. So here's the principles you can find in this story. One is that wherever Joseph was, he was faithful at that time. I find that he remembered how God led him in the past. Let us remember how God's led us. And thirdly, he was steadfast, sticking with God no matter what. How about you? Do you know what your calling is right now? How about us as a congregation? Do we know what our calling is right now? What is your job as a, as a Christian? Are you fulfilling it? Are you fulfilling your calling? Or maybe you find yourself spending more time just existing, just putting out fires or oiling squeaky wheels, if you will? Are you living a life that is purposeful? Or do you find yourself in activities that just end up being purposeless? How closely connected are you with God right now? If you sense this morning that, that your heart is saying, I think I need to be more closely connected with God. If you sense right now is a, a, a spirit of conviction upon you saying, I think I could grow. I think I could have more. I think I could have less of the world and more of Jesus. And I've got really good news for you. The reason you're having those thoughts or those feelings or the, those convictions is because God is calling you. Because he's taken the initiative. He's speaking to your heart. And if he is, there's only one logical and best solution. Submit to him. When he says to do it, it's easy to say, yes, Lord, I'll do whatever you say. But isn't that what the, what the Israelites did? All that the Lord says we will do. How long did that last? <laughs> Not even a little more than a month did it. How about this? Lord, help me to do it. Lord, I surrender to you now. I want to be your person. I want to be your man. I want to be your woman. I want to grow. You're calling me to grow. And friends, I've got good news too. This is, it's right from the word. He who has called you is faithful also who will do it. If he's convicting you to spend more time with him and less time in the world, more time setting your mind on things above and less time spending your mind, setting your mind on the trash of this world and the fornication and the adultery and the, uh, you know, the murder and the lying and the, the deception and the drug use and taking the Lord's name in vain and all the stuff that you see in this world, all the stuff that you experience if you're on any kind of media at all or even in groups of people that aren't Christian. It's just there. It just permeates. It's just a part of this world. If you hear him calling you to set your mind above these things, off of those things, and more onto him, he will do it in you. He stands at the door and he knocks. Joseph said yes, but he just didn't say yes once. He had to say yes every single day, sometimes moment by moment. There's Mrs. Potiphar calling him. I mean, this poor guy hasn't been with a woman. <laughs> I mean, you'd think that maybe as a hot-blooded man, he might have wanted to say yes. But something trumped that, didn't it? It was his faithfulness to God. It was God's command. And God placed him in a position who was the second most powerful man in the world. He got his wife, Azaneth. He got his children. And he was blessed. But it was in God's time. You will be too. And you are. So I ask you this morning, as we close, to think about what is your purpose? 
Do you know what it is? If not, ask God to reveal his next step in your life. If you do, follow Joseph's example and his, his, um, his principles to be steadfast where you are, to remember how God has led you in the past, and to remain steadfast knowing that he will, he will guide you, he'll work through you every step of the way. I want to just invite you right now as, as I close this part of this sermon that you just bow your heads with me and you know what the Lord's been speaking to your heart and I don't. So I'll give you a moment. I'm going to, and I'm going to start a prayer and then I'm going to just give you a moment to speak to the Lord in your heart before we end. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the examples of people like Joseph that were so steadfast, so faithful, and you raised him up to a high position for your glory, for your honor. We here today, each of us, have a purpose, even if we don't at the moment know what it is. Or if we do, Lord, we still need you to walk with us and, and to work through us. Wherever we are, Lord, you know. And just take a moment of silence that we can speak to you individually in our hearts about these things. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your promise that he who's called you is faithful also who will do it. Thank you for taking initiative to call us. In Jesus' name, amen.